Hello, Mike. Thank you. And uh, hello to everyone. You're joining us for another edition of Broken Bread, which are the Bible studies that we're doing from BibleBase.com. And if you're with us for the first time, you're very welcome. And if you're with us for the umpteenth time, you're still welcome too. And we're continuing in our studies, which is at this current time, we're looking at the book, The Better Covenant, that I wrote some years ago now. And we are creating a study guide to go a little bit deeper into some things and maybe to flesh things out a little bit more at different places. And uh, we're glad to have your company. And you can uh, access these studies in all kinds of ways. You can listen to them on Mike Coles' newliferadio.co.uk on the Thursday night of each week at 7 o'clock. Uh, or you can access them in the archive of that same place, <laughs> newliferadio.co.uk. Uh, you can also access them ultimately at biblebase.com. That's our main website. You can also access them at Friends of Bible Base. That is a Facebook group. You can also access them from our podcast. So if you've got a podcatcher of any kind, you ought to be able to find these under Bible Base Podcasts. If you can't, and I understand there are some people who can't, please let me know and we'll see what we can do to sort that out. So where are we? Well, we're up to study 20 today. Uh, last study that we did, we called it A Day in the Life of Moses, Part 1. And tonight you're joining us in A Day in the Life of Moses, Part 2. Let's make a start, shall we? So, with the keeping of the covenant as a necessary part of the tenancy agreement, failing to keep the covenant put the covenant community and the entire covenant project into jeopardy. They faced the prospect of losing everything. It was written into the deeds. In spite of the nation's failure to keep the covenant, God graciously permitted them to remain in the land and sent prophetic messengers to remind them of their obligations and of the penalty clauses written into the tenancy agreement. I want to look at four areas today as we wind up this little part that I've called a day in the life of Moses. It's really the book of Deuteronomy we're looking at, which is uh, really the second giving or the second application of the law. I won't go into all that. If you want to know what it's all about, please look at a day in the life of Moses, part one. I'm interested in this, the book of the law. This is a part of the Bible that is so easily forgotten and some people don't seem to know about it at all. But when Moses received the law, he wrote his own handwritten copy of it. And that was kept safe, and it was kept by the side of the Ark of the Covenant. So the two testimonies, the one written in Moses' handwriting, which was, if you like, the copy of the people of Israel, and the one written with the finger of God, which was God's copy, and they kept together because this will be the legal basis for God's relationship with his people. This will also become their tenancy agreement. And this was something that was to continue irrespective of the organization that Israel was going through. It didn't matter whether it was here during the time of Moses or later on under Joshua or later on under the judges or later on under the monarchy. Whatever it was, it, this was always the basis of God's relationship with them. And they, as far as they could, they kept these things together in that way. So here's Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 14 to 20. This is about 1,500 years approximately before Christ. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it, and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. And that happened, of course, that happened 400 years later, during the time of um, Samuel the prophet, and then Saul, their first legal king, 
and then David. So he says, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me. They weren't intended to have a king, but God knew that they would have one nevertheless. And say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. So this was not going to be dynastic necessarily to begin with. One from among your brethren. He wasn't to be uh, from another a kingdom, another nation. He was to be one of the people of the covenant. You shall set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. And then remember this is a long time. This is um, almost 500 years before Solomon, with all his splendor, came to the throne. But listen to this. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, You shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. My, it might almost have been written with Solomon in mind. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. This is the book of the covenant that lay beside the ark of the covenant in the most holy place. It shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. They were the guardians of these written codes. And it shall be with him. We're talking about the prospective king. When you choose yourself a king, you'll be the one who God chooses, etc. We've just all read that. But it says, when he comes to the moment of his enthronement, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. It's interesting that when our own queen, Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II came to the throne on the day of her um, coronation. She was handed a Bible and told that it was the most precious thing that this will could offer. It shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him. It was to be his lifelong companion. It was to go with him on mission into battle. It was to be with him wherever he was. This was to be his constant companion, and he shall read it all the days of his life. This is to say, I don't know whether we're right in calling this a quiet time, but but the kings that came were to familiarize themselves and remind themselves day by day of the implications of the book of the covenant, the thing that Israel had signed up to. He shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. So you see, it wasn't just um, the ten words as we say. It was the laws and the statutes. Why? Well, here's the reason. Listen to this. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren. You see, God who knows the hearts of men knows that there's always this tendency, if you put people in places of authority, there will be the temptation to separate themselves from the company of which they've been part, to lift themselves up above their brethren. So God says that any kings of Israel are to have their own personal copy of the Book of the Covenant, and they are to study it day by day throughout their whole life so that their heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, and it would be a tragic thing to see how the people, the kings who had intended to be shepherd kings, servant kings, increasingly became oriental kings, ruining as totalitarians, absolute kings with the power of life and death. 
that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And if you're using the notes that come with these studies, you'll find that um, that kind of thing will come through several places in the book of Deuteronomy, this reference to the, the book of the covenant, and the references are there in the notes. That book of the covenant, the law that is at the center of the nation, becomes the ultimate point of reference. This is going back, going to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 24. And it came to pass, this is explaining what this book is that I'm talking about. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of Jehovah, saying, Take this book of the law and put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of Jehovah your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. They were going to be judged and prospered according to their compliance with the laws that now constituted a tenancy agreement. It goes on, Take this book of the Lord and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. And then God, speaking through Moses prophetically, says, For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, this is Moses speaking, I am yet alive with you this day. While I am alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against Jehovah. And how much more after my death? Assemble unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears. This is Moses effectively on his deathbed. This is his last day on earth. This is the last thing he has to say to them. Assemble me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I had commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will not do but because you will do that which is evil in the sight of Jehovah, to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. So this is Moses' last work, this is Moses' last service to the people uh, that he is delivered from Egypt under the hand of God and watched over, mediated a covenant for them. Um, these, this is his last action of service to this nation to whom God had given him. And then he teaches them a song. You might wonder what kind of song he would have to teach them after giving them such a solemn admonition. And it's there in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 30. And it says, When Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So, having preached 30 chapters of the book of Deuteronomy, he now introduces a song. And if you read about it, you'll discover that really it's just underlying all these things. And then you have something that I'm calling the blessing of Moses. In Deuteronomy, this is a couple of chapters later. In Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verses 1 to 5, you have this blessing and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Jehovah came from Sinai and rose from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the ten thousands of holy ones. At his right hand was a fiery law for them. Yea, he loves the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, an inheritance for the assembly of Jacob. And then you have this cryptic line 
and he was king in Jeshurun, when the heads of the people were gathered and all the tribes of Israel together. Do you remember that these last things that Moses was saying to the people were when all the people had gathered together, that's to say all their elders, all their, what you might call their officers, their leaders, whatever they were, the heads of their houses, they're all gathered together. And it says, um, he commanded as a law an inheritance for the assembly of Jacob. And then it says, and he was king in Jeshurun. Now there are two questions that should spring to our minds immediately. Who was king in Jeshurun? And where or who is Jeshurun? Well, we know it's at the time when the heads of the people were gathered together and all the tribes of Israel were together. In other words, it's talking about the people of Israel. And it uses this word, Jeshurun, just very, very restricted times in the Old Testament. Let me show you. This is, first of all, here in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And when he'd been warning them, in the midst of his warning and actually in the midst of recounting God's faithfulness and the way he'd blessed them. <clears throat> he says this, suddenly, without any warning, but Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are, now we know who Jeshurun is. Jeshurun is another name for the people of Israel. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. What a thing to say. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. That's the first time the word Jeshurun is used. And the second time is a little bit later in the same chapter. When Moses, lifting his heart in just a paean of praise, says, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds. And then the last time, not in Deuteronomy at all, but strangely in the prophecy of Isaiah. Thus saith Jehovah that made thee and formed thee from the womb, who will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Israel, the people of Israel, were a chosen people who became God's covenant people. They became God's people to serve him. Let my people go that they may serve me. They became his people in order to fulfill his plan and purpose to receive a mission, a commission, and to fulfill it by God's enabling. I'll read that last one again in Isaiah. Thus saith Jehovah that made thee and formed thee from the womb, who will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Charles Wesley wrote a wonderful, wonderful nine-verse hymn called None is Like Jeshurun's God. And for those of you who actually have it, uh, well, it's, it, it's here in its fullness on the notes that go with this. I won't. Maybe I'll just tease you and read the first and the last verse. None is like Jeshurun's God, so great, so strong, so high. Lo, he spreads his wings abroad, he rides upon the sky. Israel, his firstborn son. God, the eternal God, is thine. See him, in thy help come down the excellence divine. I'm going to read it all. The, the great Jehovah deigns to succor and defend. Thee, the eternal God sustains, thy maker and thy friend. And then he transposes this into the gospel. Sinner, what hast thou to dread? Safe from all impending harms, God hath underneath thee spread his everlasting arms. God is thine. Disdain to fear the enemy within. God shall in thy flesh appear and make an end of sin. God the man of sin shall slay 
fill thee with triumphant joy. God shall thrust him out and say, destroy them all. Destroy. This is Wesleyan holiness for you. All the struggle then is o'er, and wars and fighting cease. Israel then shall sin no more, but dwell in perfect peace. All his enemies are gone. Sin shall have in him no part. Israel now shall dwell alone with Jesus in his heart. He's actually made the switch. He's talking about the Israel of God, the people of God's people, this amazing promise. All the struggle then is o'er, no civil war on the inside of the man who's in Christ. And wars and fighting cease, Israel then shall sin no more, but dwell in perfect peace. All his enemies are gone, sin shall have in him no part. Israel now shall dwell alone with Jesus in his heart. And then he refers back to his picture. In a land of corn and wine, his lot shall be below. Comfort there and blessings join, and milk and honey flow. Jacob's well is in his soul. Gracious dew his heavens distill. Fill his spirit already full, and shall forever fill. Blessed, O Israel, art thou. What people is like thee? Saved from sin by Jesus now thou art, and still shalt be. Jesus is thy sevenfold shield. Jesus is thy flaming sword. Earth and hell and sin shall yield to God's almighty word. God's almighty word shall stand. Thine enemies shall fall, fade away at his command, and sink and perish all. Liars shall they all be found, who all who cried it cannot be. Sin should ever quit its ground and have no place in thee. Christ shall make thee free indeed when he appears within. Thou on self and pride shalt tread on all the strength of sin. Thou shalt more than conquer it. Thou shalt see it all depart, see it dead beneath thy feet, no longer in thy heart. And then this wonderful ninth verse, God, the gracious God and true, hath spoke the faithful word. He, the mighty work, shall do. Our trust is in the Lord. He, the mountain, shall remove. He, the sinner, shall restore. He shall perfect me in love, and I shall sin no more. Oh, they don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> they never did write them like that. This is the glorious poetry and scope and reach of Wesley's hymns. So, none is like Jeshurun's God. The word Jeshurun actually means upright. My upright one. So all these promises are to my upright one. They are to the people who would become the people who are God's witnesses. You are my witnesses, says Jehovah. That's Isaiah. You are my witnesses. And this is, if you like, this is God's, we've had his vision statement. This is God's mission statement now. You're going to be my upright ones. This is his intention, his promise. My upright one. But if you remember, we said that we were looking at this Last sentence with two questions. Who was king in Jeshurun? And what is Jeshurun? Well, we found out who Jeshurun is. It's the people of Israel under God's rule. So we know who the king is. This is Jehovah, the king of Israel. Moses was never king. He was deliverer, advocate, prophet, mediator, a friend of God but never crowned and never king. These really are amazing things. I would encourage you, if only to read that Charles Wesley hymns, to uh, find the notes that go with these studies and follow them through. If you would like, I'll find you some music for them as well. Now I want to talk about the successes of Moses, and I know our time is going very quickly. I've got several men here I just want to kind of draw attention to, 
because it comes from something that Moses said on the day of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 19. He's speaking to the gathered people, and he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the Lord God in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And then listen to this. This is a word that God spoke into the heart of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 15, I think this is verses 18 and 19. And Jehovah said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. In case you're just listening to this in a podcast, I'm going to read it again. And Jehovah said to me, what they have said is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. That is a stunning promise of a prophet who would come one who would be like Moses, this Moses who was deliverer and mediator and leader of the people. I'm going to give you another one, says God. He'll be like you. He'll be from among your brethren. He won't come from another kingdom outside. I'll put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him And he'll have the power of life and death, this prophet. It shall be that whoever will not hear my voice, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Who is that prophet? Well, let's work our way through the suspects, shall we? I suppose Joshua is the immediate first suspect, because we know that Joshua took on the role of leading the people of Israel. Joshua is a, you know, don't you, that the name Joshua in Greek is Jesus and the name Jesus is Yehoshua in Hebrew. So we have a book in the Bible called the Book of Jesus, although we're familiar with it as the Book of Joshua. And all through his life, Joshua must have been, Jesus must have been conscious of his mission, of his commission. He was Joshua, the man chosen by God to fulfill all God's purpose and bring the people into the intended blessing. Is Joshua the man then? This is Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now it came to pass after the death of Moses, the servant of Jehovah, that Jehovah spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou, and all this people unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon to you, I have given it. As I spake unto Moses, Oh, so is this the prophet. Here's Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. There shall not be any... This is some early days in Joshua. This is God speaking. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Mm, Beginning to sound as though Joshua is the person who will fulfill Moses' prophecy. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt cause this people to inherit the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous to observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest have good success whithersoever thou goest. 
This book of the law. Oh, yeah. Here we go. This book of the law. It, it almost sounds as though when Moses is, uh, when Joshua is hearing this, he's either got the book in his hands um, or he's where the book is, maybe in that tabernacle that God had prepared for them. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1, verse 16. This is the people now answering, giving their response to all these things. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us we will do. Wherever you send us we will go. Hmm. They said that 40 years ago, three times. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, <laughs> the memory is amazing in its selection, isn't it? Just as we heeded Moses in all things. Hmm. I worked for a lawyer for a while, and uh, they had a little phrase, and they said, I was supposed to be kind of managing part of their office. And uh, they used to say that managing lawyers was like trying to herd cats all fiercely independent and heading off in all kinds of direction. Yeah, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord be your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Well, it does seem superficially that Joshua is a good candidate. But even after Joshua, we read this in the book of Hebrews, God was still promising that this deliverer would come. So we know it couldn't have been Joshua. Well, how about another likely suspect? This is David. Later God entered into yet another covenant, covenant with King David. As was prophesied, a time came in their continuing contrariness when they wanted a king the story of how the nation became a monarchy is a tragedy that God transmuted into a blessing. He can do that if you have really made a major mistake in the direction you have taken. Understand that God is into second blessings and he can take, he can take clay that has been misformed in his hands and remake it again, another vessel, as it pleases him. This is God working with the nation. The story of how the nation became a monarchy is a tragedy that God transmuted into a blessing. We need to return to our starting point yet again to understand the implications of this. The covenant community nation was created to be different. They were not just one of the many people groups that would develop into nation states in this part of the world. This nation was different. It was designed to be different. Its ultimate purpose was not to provide a living space for people or a promise of greatness. Its purpose was to create a people for God's exclusive use and purpose. A nation whose purpose was to be a kingdom of priests to serve God. Let's remind ourselves of that foundation. Way back in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, this is the promise, the conditional promise that God is putting forward to the people he's delivered from Egypt. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be mine own possession from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, says God to Moses, that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. It would be good, too, to remind ourselves of how often that personal pronoun, me, my, mine, is used in this small excerpt. It's a frequent human failing to interpret these accounts in a man-centered way. But the whole thrust of this Sinai covenant was that this nation would become God's personal possession or treasure. This nation was designed to be different, very different, 
their food laws and Sabbath observance would make them conspicuously different. What a tragedy then, when the predicted loss of the vision statement resulted in the demand, no, we don't want to go this way, we want to be like everybody else. This is the record, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 19 to 20. But the people refused to hearken unto the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. O oh, Israel, O oh, Jeshurun, what have you come to? Jehovah was king in Jeshurun. What have you come to? And we know it wasn't David either, because in Psalm 110, David writes this, Jehovah says unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. So, if Jehovah says to my Lord, Jesus asked this question, didn't he? He said, if David calls him Lord, whose son is he? <laughs> There's no answer to that, is there? Unless you receive the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. So, no, it wasn't David. And in fact, through David's dynasty, which lasted for a long time, at different times God blessed the disobedient, backsliding people. And when he did, it was always a return to the covenant law. It was always a return to the book of the covenant. And uh, one of the most famous of these, of course, is Josiah. And at his time, when he first became the king, Everything was absolutely in chaos. The tabernacle itself was filled with idols and wrong worship. The holy things had been put away in an old junk room somewhere. Um, they, they, they even lost trace of the Book of the Covenant. And then, as they were clearing it all out, they found it. And ultimately, they brought the message of it to Josiah. And Josiah said, Go ye, inquire of Jehovah for me and for my people, and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of Jehovah that is kindled against us. Because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written there. No, it wasn't David. It wasn't his dynasty. It was David who was looking forward to the one who should come. So, any other suspects? Well, how about John the Baptist? The people were still looking for Moses' successor when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's John chapter 1, verse 21. This is the people from Jerusalem who have come to ask John the Baptist a question. And they asked him and they said, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? What prophet? No, I'm not reading now. I'm just interjecting. Are you the prophet? What prophet are they thinking about? They're thinking about this prophet that Moses predicted. Their messianic theology is all messed up. It's, they don't know quite how to untangle it. But they come up with these things and you can see how they were groping to understand what was going to happen next. And they asked him, what then are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Oh, so... John the Baptist eliminates himself. Here's John chapter 1 and verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Okay, so now we're on the trail. Who is the one who fulfills the prophets? Who have Philip and Nathanael found? Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. The early Christians saw very clearly from the beginning that Christ replaced Moses. He was the prophet that had been promised. During the early days of Jesus' ministry, the new covenant was in sight with a new mediator and the religious leaders of the day saw it and they resisted it. 
Maybe you recall this conversation between a man who had been born blind and who was now healed and the Pharisees and the leaders. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you do not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple. We are Moses. Ultimately, the Jewish leaders knew that you have to be under the authority of Moses or under the authority of someone else. You're either Moses' disciple or you're Jesus' disciple. You cannot be both. Listen to Peter in full flow of revelation on the day of Pentecost and the days that followed it. When people were responding, he says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. Okay, Peter is clearly speaking of Jesus, the one who had been prophesied or preached to them before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And then he quotes one of the holy prophets. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Okay, here it is absolutely as clear as crystal. The prophet that Moses predicted under the inspiration of the Spirit is Jesus Christ himself. And the early Christians saw it, and it was this understanding that actually began to cause part of the separation. Here's Stephen on the day of his death. This is Stephen's, a day in the life of Stephen. This is Acts chapter 7, verses 37 following. This is what Moses said to the children of Israel. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in now, the old King James Version has the word church here. This was he who was in the church in the wilderness. That was God's old covenant people. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. In other words, they identified clearly that Jesus was the one who had been predicted, the one who would lead his people, the one who would be like Moses and yet greater than Moses, greater than Moses, greater than John the Baptist, greater than all the Old Testament saints, for all their marvellous faith, there needed to be another one who comes from heaven and he comes to be the one who will set the law of God in the hearts of his people. Not in a physical building now, but now he will write them in the hearts of his people and in their thoughts so that from the least to the greatest there will be no more need to constantly say to people, obey the Lord, listen to what God is saying, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. My, this is a different covenant, isn't it? This is an amazingly different covenant. This, brothers and sisters, and here we will pause until next time. This is a better covenant. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and uh, we pray God's continued blessing on you and hope, God willing, to see you back here. Same time, same place, next week. God bless you.